little weird to stand here and be the guest preacher, I got to say. And I have to be honest, I'm thinking about my friend Scott this morning. A lot has happened in the world in the six weeks that he's been gone. And I know, because I know him, better maybe than he wishes I did. I know that there is a lot he has wanted to preach and blog on because, gosh darn it, he's got stuff to say. And so I've been thinking about him this week with all that's happened and all that he has probably wanted to say to you over the last six weeks. And I've wondered, too, about the times over the last six weeks when you were really hopeful to hear his reassuring voice say to you, I love y'all. Let's love one another this week. And so perhaps my being here this morning at this almost halfway, I'm like week seven and there's like seven more weeks, so I'm sort of the halfway point for you, and maybe that's not coincidence. Maybe there's something to me being here this morning to bring a bit of familiar and family into the pulpit this morning. Not that Tom and Laura haven't done that with the liturgy, but something different happens in this lofty perch way up here near the rafters. I know that to be true. And I want to say, I know that there are many of you sitting out there that don't know me. That makes me so happy. That really, really does. Good job, church. That makes me so happy. And you don't know me, but I know you. I know quite a bit about you, even if I don't know your name. Because as a part of this beloved community, we share something in common. We share a beloved community. We share core values. We share hopes and dreams for the future. And I hope this morning that you feel the systematic trust of this community that has been pieced together with such love and care and joy and that you will extend a little bit of that trust to me this morning. And I have to be honest, this was a really hard sermon for me to get my head around. Even with my beloved friend Laura's direction of beloved community, I have wondered, what is it that only I can say this morning to you? What is it that I, perhaps the least of these, of all of these amazing preachers that you have had in and that you will still have, what is it that only I can say to you during this sabbatical time? <laughs> Suddenly, somewhere, Scott Colgas, you're just twitched. <laughs> Afraid. What is it that only I can say? And then, of course, when I thought I had it all figured out, everything I thought I was supposed to say to you, everything changed this week, and I had to rewrite my daggone sermon on the airplane on the way out here to reflect all the craziness that has happened in the world this week. And as I started writing at 40,000 feet, I thought... I am really grateful to be here with you this morning where I still feel so loved and beloved and safe. Safe to say that this morning I'm sad and I am pissed off. And I am glad that I have beloved community to share that with this morning where I can be honest, where I can open up my heart and be vulnerable and when I can look out at people I love and say that the world has gone stark raving mad and we have lost our damn minds. 
I can say that because you know me and you know I have a potty mouth. <laughs> and yet, this morning, I am so grateful to be here with you because being here with you gives me such hope. In the midst of all the sadness and the pissed offness and the anger and everything else, looking out at you gives me hope this morning. I look at you, beloved community, and I have hope. I want us to look closely at this text from Acts 2 before I get too carried away with my potty mouth. All week I have looked at this text, and the line that keeps working on me is the one that I don't like very much. God added to their number those who were being saved. Ooh, saved. Now that's a tricky word. It makes some of us very, very nervous. We progressive folk, we don't like to talk much about being saved. It makes us very nervous. We have baggage around that. What does that mean? That's where my heart's been all week. What does that mean to be saved? Well, when I read this story, it seems to me that salvation comes to the Acts 2 people through community. Think about it. Think about the events of this week. People are longing for connection. People are desperate to feel like they have a place where they can belong, to feel like I feel this morning, and maybe even some of you do too, safe and connected and beloved. Saved. Did you see Ken Burns' commencement address at Stanford? Come on, did you see Ken Burns' address at commencement at Stanford? Yes, no, come on. Be alive out there, people. Come on, be alive. No. Okay, if you did not see it, go and watch it. Okay? This is homework. Homework, go and watch it. Okay, Ken Burns said a few weeks ago in his Stanford graduation speech, we live in an age of social media where we are constantly assured that we are independent agents. But that free agency is essentially unconnected to real community. What is real community? Seems to me there is beloved community and then there is polite community. And those are two very different things. Polite community. What do you not talk about in polite community? What do you not talk about in polite? I know this is hard. I know this is difficult for you sometimes. What do you not talk about in polite community? We do this at Community Christian Church in Kansas City. I, I make them talk to me. What do we not talk about? Politics. politics. Oh, we don't talk about politics in polite community. No. What else? Religion. No, no. Don't talk about religion. What else? Money, sex, don't talk about sex. Race, we don't talk about race in polite community. That'll be enough for today. <laughs> Real community. What makes beloved community different than polite community? Well, when we look at the Acts 2 community, it says they shared all things, and with sincere hearts, they lived together. And it says a reverent fear overtook them all. Reverent fear. Why were they afraid? Why were they afraid? If this community was so beloved and is an example for us as we strive to create beloved community in the world, why were they afraid? Because truly living in beloved community requires us to open up ourselves to one another. It requires us to commit to somebody else other than just ourselves. We commit to the well-being of another. And when we do that, 
we open ourselves up to being vulnerable, and vulnerable is scary. And I think about you when I was thinking about opening up ourselves with reverent fear to community. I think about the way so many of you who I know have opened up your hearts to this beloved community, to making this beloved community, and not just polite community, a place where you allow people to know your gifts and your weaknesses, a place that nurtures your dreams, a place that says you matter and you are beloved. And that changes you. When you open yourselves up to that, it changes you. And once you are changed, things around you begin to change too. And maybe, just maybe, when we open ourselves up fully to that kind of community, we might find salvation. And we might be saved. I have heard stories of salvation in this space. Your husband dies and you sit in the back for weeks and just weep because it's all you can do until one day you realize it's safe not to cry and you can engage in life again and there is salvation. I have heard stories, gay folks from small towns somewhere, anywhere, and you waited five or 10 or sometimes more than 50 years to know you have a place and a tribe and you are beloved. And then one day you find this community and you discover you've been saved. I think of a young woman who didn't grow up with a church, and she found this place. She found her voice and her calling and her real self, and it saved her. And then you sent her off to Bright Divinity School, where she is stirring up all kinds of trouble. <laughs> and there is salvation in finding your voice and your calling. I know that because you gave me that so many times over the last year. I think of you and you have saved me from myself. Knowing that there was a place, even when I didn't believe in me, I remembered moments when you believed in me and it saved me. I know some of you who are questioning self-identified atheists, although I don't believe you. And you show up. You show up here not because you believe anything, but just because you like to hear Christoph play the organ. <laughs> and there is salvation. And then you go to a dinner party and you find somebody else just like you, but not like you. Their story sounds the same and yet their skin is a different color or they were born somewhere else and yet they are so much like me. And then you find that there is this community that would not be otherwise and we are saved. I could go on, but these are your stories. Stories that you have shared with me, and that is sacred stuff. Vulnerable stories told in reverent fear, just like in Acts 2. Fear, because really? Can there really, really be a place such as this? Can there really be beloved community where I could belong? Maybe you are sitting there this morning and you've been visiting and you keep waiting because you keep thinking, what's the catch? 
There's got to be a catch to this gig. And there is a catch. There is a catch. The catch is, my friends, that when you find beloved community, you have entered the realm of holy stuff. And that is not like other kinds of community. Beloved community is sacred and holy and maybe even magic, if that word suits you. And it is so very rare in the world. And that's why I get pissed off. Because it shouldn't be rare. But then I have hope. Because I look out at you and all that you might still do. And I have hope. And I imagine and I wonder. I wonder if that's not what happened in the beloved community we find in the Acts 2 story. Many signs and wonders were performed and many were saved. And if that is not this. If that is not this, if that is not you, if that is not the work you are doing day by day by day, you. And it can't just be the work that happens in this pulpit. It cannot just be the work of Scott and Laura and the staff. There is tremendous grace, my friends, and beloved community, but there is a whole lot of responsibility involved in it, too. The Acts 2 community did not remain the same. We do not have the first communist church of Jerusalem, do we? No. The answer is no. They grew, they changed, they evolved. People moved away, new people came in. A circle, a circle of trust and community, ever expanding, yet unbroken. Beloved community just doesn't magically appear. It takes work, a lot of hard work. And if we try, and if we try, and if we try again, we can make it happen. The Acts 2 community had to create and recreate themselves time and time and time again. New people came, other people left. New leadership came, others stepped away. Pieces moved and pieces changed, and yet the spirit remained the same. That, my friends, is when you know it is beloved community. Now here's the scary part. The beloved community of Acts 2 changed the course of the world. Because people were saved. People found their real selves. There was transformation and that changes you. And once that happens, there is no going back. And still today, Still today, people are longing to be saved because we've lost our damn minds. We are killing one another. We are spouting hate about one another, screaming at one another because we don't really know one another. We have forgotten the power of what it means to be beloved community because we're too damn busy being polite community. We have settled for polite community and that is getting us nowhere. And I look around, I look at this space, I see black folks and white folks and gay folks and straight folks and Jews and atheists, American-born folks and folks born in other places as well, Nicaragua and Korea and Mexico, Salvadoran New Yorkers, you're here. 
That's someplace else. <laughs> Texans, I see you. And Southerners, for God's sake, I see you too. Small town, big city, all of you here together. All of you here together. And not just here on Sunday mornings, but sharing your lives together. Celebrating new babies and new jobs. Breaking bread together over your beautiful dinner tables and your tiny patio tables. And later we're going to tell crazy stories over a bottle of wine. That is beloved community. And that is salvation. And the world is desperate. The world is desperate for that kind of salvation. And this desperation sets us on the edge of something very strong and very powerful. And we have to choose. We have to make a decision. Because out of this great chaos is a great opportunity. But we are going to have to try. And we're going to have to try again. And we're going to have to try again to make it a reality. Wholeness and belovedness for each and every one of God's children. I believe it with my whole heart. We need more of this. Whatever this is, whatever sacred, holy thing that has been created here and continues to be created, this circle ever widening, and yet doesn't even really look like a circle anymore because it's all mixed up and mashed up and crazy shape, whatever it is. We need more of this. And you have to make it happen. You have to make it happen. You must continue to extend this circle of this community ever wider. And if it happens, when it happens, people are saved. And the world changes. An unbroken circle created with each sign and wonder we perform in the world. And when we do our part, when we do our part, beloved, day by day, God will continue to add to the number of those being saved. May it be so. May it be so for us. Amen.